Good morning, Grace. Uh, thank you, praise team, uh, for that song. And I want to welcome all of you to our, our service today. Uh, before we get started, there's a couple things I need to uh, address. Uh, one of them is people have been wondering, uh, when are we coming back? And uh, I know many churches are actually coming back uh, uh, this week. And uh, I've heard, talked to other people who said they weren't coming back until they're able to hug. They feel like it's not church unless we're able to hug, so they're going to keep doing what they're doing. So there is no right or wrong answer. And so we've put together a team uh, that is researching things, what that looks like. And so our, our, our target date is, is July 5th. That's our target date for coming back. But there are a lot of things that have to go in place. And so we're going to learn from other people who are doing things, what mistakes they made. Uh, but our concern is the safety of our people. And so we, every, every, every group of leaders, churches, have to be concerned as what's the best way for our church? What's the best way for our people in protecting our people? So I didn't want to let you know that. Please be in prayer about that. I, I've talked to a number of pastors. Another thing I want to talk about, uh, who, who this Sunday, they've changed their service or changed their message because of the, um, the unrest and what's happening in our society. And I just want to say to you, God, God has not led me to do that. I think uh, the message we're going to have today is relevant uh, to what's happening. Uh, but I do want to say a few words, a few things uh, before we get into the message about what's going on. First of all, if, if, if you're not able to see uh, the post that we, we did uh, on YouTube and Facebook, I encourage you to go to see that post. Uh, one of my concerns, and, and, and I've, I've, I have the responsibility of shepherding this flock. And so my concern is for this flock. My love is for this flock. And I just want to share some things I think will help us as a church as we, as, as we go through this. The first thing I, I want to ask is, is, that, is that believers would be um, guided by the Holy Spirit and they would be cautious of their posting. Uh, I'm not on social media, so I don't know about that. But I, I would just ask you to be cautious of your posting and the things that you say to make sure your posting are done with love and they're done with the cause of Christ. I would ask you to ask two quest three questions before you push sin on that post. One of them is, is what I'm about to post going to help the cause of Christ or is it going to hinder the cause of Christ? That's the first question. The second question I'd ask you is this, uh, will it advance the gospel? Is what I'm getting ready to post, it, will, it, it, will it aid to advancing the gospel? And then the third thing is, will it demonstrate the love of Christ? Is what I'm getting ready to post demonstrate? Because once you hit that button, you can't pull that back. And it has a great impact on a lot of people. The other thing I would say is this, as we relate to one another on social media, I would just encourage us uh, if something is said, if something is, is done that you disagree with. Uh, I remember as a kid growing up, and there's a term that we grew up learning from our parents, and the, the, it, it was this. It was not that we don't have dirty laundry, but we're not going to put our dirty laundry outside on the line. Now, some of you may have no idea what that means because you have a washer and dryer. You don't understand about putting your clothes on the line. Uh, but in other words, we're not going to deal with our grievances and our issues in public. That's the idea. And so I, I would ask you, if there's issues and things, call the person up. Talk to them. Explain what, 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 what concerned you. Ask questions about what they meant by what they said. Give them the benefit of the doubt and talk things out in love. Don't, don't do things in public. I, I don't think that honors God. And so I want to encourage you to do that. I think the other thing is I, I want us to, to learn through this how to love one another. And that's the question. How do I demonstrate love to my brother and my sister? How do I demonstrate love to people? God has called us to be a vehicle of love and express his glory, to be light and salt. And I want to encourage us, how do we love one another? I think, I think one thing that we need to understand is, is this. As, as we do that, ask the Holy Spirit or Holy Spirit, guide my actions, guide my words, lead me, direct me. If it's something that I want to say that you're not in agreement with it, let me know. Um, but that's important that we, we're following the Holy Spirit. I, I think we have to understand there are people who are hurting. There are people who are frustrated. There are people who are angry. Uh, for many parts of our society, this has evoked uh, bitter feelings, past history, a lot of anger. And so we've got to be willing to love and listen through that. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says this, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care one for another. For if one suffers, all suffer. And if one is honored, all is honored. Now you are the body of Christ and individually 
members of it. We're a part of that same body. Romans 12, 15 says this, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And I just encourage you this, even though you may not understand, even though you may not have the same experience that other people have, understand that there are brothers and sisters who are struggling with this, who are hurting with this, and my call is to empathize. My call is to be able to reap, to weep with those who are weeping and reaching out to those people who are, who, who are, who are, who are weeping. So I think, I think those are very important things. And I've had a number of brothers who have reached out to me and just said, hey, how are you doing? How are you handling this? I want you to know I'm, I'm praying for you. I think the other thing, um, the, the um, fellowship, the Karis Fellowship has, has put together a document in response to this. And I'm not gonna take time to read this document. I think, I think it's good. I think it's a start, it's not perfect, but I think it's, it's a start. But I just wanna read parts of what it says. It says, as leaders, as leaders and representatives of Karis Fellowship, we affirm our belief in God who has created all persons in his image, who commands all persons are, who commands that all persons are to be treated with dignity and respect, regardless of their social, economic, or ethnic background. We grieve the violent and lawless death of George Floyd, and we call for justice on his behalf as prescribed by the U.S. Constitution and, and, and judicial system. We recognize this problem extends far beyond this single horrendous act. Whatever its motive, yet it has resurfaced the fault line of racism within our midst. Karis Fellowship condemns racism in any form. And another part of this, he says this, we affirm the commitment to biblical truth that God cares deeply about the issues of justice and human dignity. Yet we recognize that our society continues to struggle with injustice and inequity toward minorities, and we grieve with those who suffer these consequences. We believe followers of Jesus Christ, and get this, cannot remain passive or silent and must embrace our responsibility to stop doing wrong, learn to do right, seek justice, and defend the oppressed, Isaiah 1, 16 through 17. And so I, I think this is a great start, but, but, but I, but I want to say, as we look at this, sometimes we think silence is silence. But we need to understand that silence is also communication. That when we're silent, we are actually communicating. And I think as a church, we need, as church as individuals, we need to communicate. And, and th certain things we cannot continue to be silent. And then the last thing I want to say is prayer. I want to say is prayer. We've got to be people of prayer. This doesn't drive us to our knees. We need to pray. Pray for unity in the body. Pray for us to be light. Pray for change in our systems. Uh, pray for peace. Pray for God to, to bring people to Christ. That's the only thing that's really going to help is when people's hearts are changed and they come to know Christ. So we need to be people of prayer. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share that as, 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 your, as your pastor, as your shepherd. And, and I hope that it helps us as a body uh, to communicate love. So let's get into the message today. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter, chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 27 through 30, which is good. Uh, we only live dealing with four verses, but four verses can, 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 can become long. And so we've entitled this message, Living Worthy. We've entitled this message, Living Worthy. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray now as we open your word, speak to us. Open our hearts to hear what you want to say. I pray that you would speak through me in spite of me. I, I'll ask now that you allow me to step into your authority and power. In Christ's name, amen. So verse 27 of, chapter, of Philippians chapter 1, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And, and, and the real idea of that is, what he's saying is, I want you to understand that you walk worthy as citizens. Now remember, he's talking to the Philippian church, which Philippi is a Roman colony, and because they are a Roman colony, they are citizens. But I think Paul goes deep further than that. Uh, Philippians 2.20 says that we are citizens of heaven, and Paul is calling them to realize that they are not just citizens of Philippi, but they're citizens, they're citizens of heaven. And as citizens of heaven, they have a responsibility to walk worthy. Uh, Ephesians 4 tells us that, 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 that we're, to, we're to walk worthy of our calling. We're told in Colossians chapter 1, in Colossians 1, we're told to walk worthy 
of the Lord in Colossians 1. He says, by fully pleasing him, we walk worthy by pleasing him, by bearing fruit and by increasing in the knowledge of Christ, that as we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ, we are walking worthy. And so we're called here to walk worthy. The, the, the idea is, is to be people of integrity, is to be people who live the way they preach, live the way they teach, live what they believe. You live out what you say you believe, you live out what you preach, and you live out what you teach. Yeah, I want you to understand, the, the greatest weapon we have against the enemy is not our message, it's not a message, it's not a sermon, it's not our song. The greatest weapon we have against the enemy is a consistent life, is a consistent righteous life. And so we're to live consistently as citizens. We're to live consistently as citizens. And, and, and the issue is this, for some people, they're not gonna go to our church. For some people, they're not gonna read their Bible. What the world is gonna see about what the world is going to learn about the gospel of Jesus Christ is what they are learning in us, is what they see in us, is how we live. That's how they're going to hear about the gospel, is how we live. And so Paul understood that. And Paul said, I want you to know, I need you to walk worthy, to walk worthy. Uh, Paul, Paul, Paul says this in another place in 2 Corinthians, he says this, that you are the epistle of Christ. You're the letter. People are reading you and you're representing the gospel. I came across a poem entitled, you are, you, you, you are Writing the Gospel. It says this, a chapter each day by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithful or true, just what the gospel is according to you. And that's Paul's idea. I want you to walk worthy of the gospel, because people need to understand the gospel, that we walk worthy of the gospel. And then he says, we're to walk worthy of the gospel so that whether I come to you and see you or I'm absent, my desire is to come to you. But if I don't get there, I want to hear that you are standing firm in the spirit. I want to know that you're standing firm in the spirit. Uh, chapter four, verse one says this. Therefore, brothers whom I love and long for, my joy, my crown, stand firm in the Lord. The idea of stand firm means be in place. It means stand upright, be stationary, be where God wants you to be. Don't run, don't, don't quit on this fight, but I, but I want to make sure that you are standing firm in this, in, in this fight. And he said, I want you to stand firm. I want you to stand, standing firm in one spirit and one mind. I want you to stand firm in unity. That's the idea of having one mind, one spirit, that we are standing firm in unity. And so Paul wants us to, that's, that's his prayer, that we, would stand further, that we would stand firm in unity. Now, chapter 2 talks a little more about unity. I can go in and say a lot more, but we'll deal with that in chapter 2 because it deals with the idea of unity that's there. But the next thing he says there in, in verse 27 is this, that we would stand firm with one spirit and with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. The, 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 next, the next part of that, as, 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 as we look at this, the next thing we need to know is this. We're to work collectively. We're to live consistently. We're to work collectively. The word he uses standing side by side is, or, or being side by side is really an athletic term. Paul used a lot of athletic uh, jargon. And the idea there is this. It means being a part of the same team. Victory comes as a team. We have to understand that when God placed us in the body of Christ, we became a team. We were never meant to do the Christian life alone. We were meant to do the Christian life as a team, and victory comes as a team. That's why he talks about us being a part of the body, us being gifted, Romans 12, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, that each one of us has been given different gifts to be used in the body, to building the body, because we're all a part of the team. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16 Ephesians 4, 16 says this, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part working properly makes the body grow so that the body itself grows up in love. And so what he's saying there is this, that God has placed us together. We're connected as a body. 
we're a part of a team. And when the whole body is working together, when each part of the body is doing their job, the body is growing and the body is being effective to do what God wants us to be. And so he says, that, I want you to, to understand that you, that you need to strive, that, that we need to strive side by side, that we're a part of a team. And this is what Satan does. Satan's way of, dis, of distracting the church is to cause division. If he can cause division, because you understand that, 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 when, that when the church is divided, it affects the gospel going forward. And Satan's way of distracting and causing, and, causing, and causing problems is to cause division in the body of Christ. And that's why, again, at Grace Church, I want us to say, as we deal with these social issues, we've got to understand we cannot allow these issues to cause division in the body of Christ. We have got to show love. We have got to demonstrate love. It's not about issues. It's not about politics. And that's where the world is taking it. It's about God's plan and God's love and what God wants to do through his body. And if we're going to win, we're going to win as a team. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 4 verses 9 uh, sa says this, um, it's not good for a person to be alone. It's basically, basically what he's saying there. It's not good for, 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 for us to be alone because if, if one person falls, if he has somebody with him, he has somebody help him up. But what happens to the person who's trying to live the Christian life alone and they fall? There's no one there to pick him up. And so we need to understand that we are a part of the team that is there. Look at verse 28 back in Philippians. He says, and not frightened, in anything by your opponents. Understand you're going to have, a, we have opponents. And so what he's saying there is, is contend with courage. Is contend with courage. We have opponents to the gospel. And I want you to contend with courage. I don't want you to become fearful. I don't want you to become frightened. I don't want you to run away. But I want you to have confidence. I want you in this battle for the gospel and standing for Christ. I want you to be fearless to be fearless. That's what Paul's telling this group of people from prison. Be fearless. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 say this, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, now get this, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, I may confidently say, the Lord is my helper I will not fear. I'm not going to fear the opponents. I'm not going to fear what happened, what men will do to me. Paul says, I want you to contend with, with courage, to be courageous and not to fear. Second Timothy chapter 1, 7, we all know this, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us the spirit of, of, of power and of love and of sound mind. And those are the things now, in, 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 our, in, our, in our times now, that the church needs. The spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of sound mind. Those are the things the world needs to see the church have. And so we need to we work at that. So he says, I want you to understand that, that, that we, are, we are not opponents. Look what he says then. He says, and this is a clear sign to them of their destruction. That when you are being persecuted and you're suffering and you are not showing fear and the gospel was going forward and you're standing for the gospel, it is a clear sign that God is going to judge his enemies. Now, please understand, this is not anything for us to rejoice about because our hearts should go out for those people. But God has promised, God has said he's going to, he's going to, he's going to judge his enemies. Uh, second second uh, Thessalonians uh, 1 verses 4 through 8. You can read it on your own. We don't have time to go there. But then he says, not only is it a sign that God is going to judge his enemies, but it's also a sign of your salvation. It's a sign that God is going to deliver us as we handle this suffering in the way that God wants us to handle this suffering. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 says this, Indeed, all who desire to live godly, when you make up your mind that you're going to live God and you're going to follow Christ. Remember, Paul is writing this book as one follower to another. When you make up your mind that you're going to follow Christ and live godly, you will be persecuted or you will suffer persecution. And so it's a sign to you that you're saved when you, people are persecuting and you have opposition. It's a sign of that. And God says, and I will deliver. And, 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 I, and I know that that sort of throws people off. You mean I'm going to be, per yes, persecution comes with the territory. Look at verse 29. 
For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. I want you to understand that we're to suffer graciously. We're to suffer graciously. That, that, that term there, it has been granted to you. That word, that word granted uh, actually comes from the word we get grace and favor. In other words, God is saying it has been graced onto you. It has been favored to you not only to believe in the gospel. Wouldn't it be nice if all we had to do is believe and we live happily ever after? It doesn't work that way. I wish it did. But it's been granted to us. It's been graced to us not only to believe but to suffer for Christ's sake. Wait, wait a minute. You, you, mean, you mean God is... God is saying that suffering is a part of his grace, that suffering is a part of what he's doing in, in our life. Yes, it's been granted to us that we are to believe, but we are to suffer for his sake, for his purposes, for what glorifies him. We're to, we're to make God, Christ, look good in our suffering. John chapter 16, verse 33 Jesus said this, in the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Tribulation is going to happen. We're going to have tribulation, but I want you to take heart because I have overcome the world. We're to, be, we're to suffer with grace. In, in Acts chapter 5, verse 41 and 40, Acts chapter 5, verses 41 and 40, the Peter and John have just been brought to before the authorities and they've been beaten and it says this and when they had called in the apostles they beat them and they charged them not to speak in the name of jesus and let them go now get this verse 41 then they left their they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for his name that blows me away they've just gotten beaten they've been scolded and they leave rejoicing that they have been, had the ability to honor God and to be persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. Paul said persecution is going to come and we're to suffer, we're to make sure that we're suffering graciously. Now, now why does God allow persecution in our life? I, 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 think, I think a lot of times God allows persecution um, because he's trying to develop some, something in our life. I heard this example. It's like it's like lifting weights. If you were to, to start lifting weights, you take those weights and you lift. And what happens? The weights actually make you sore. They really don't help you. Your muscles become sore and it's hard. But as a result of having your muscles sore, you're building muscles. So there's positive benefit in your life. But if I were to take those same weights and throw them at you with the purpose of hitting you and hurting you, that's not going to have benefit to your life. Right. And so I think that is what happens. Um, God puts suffering in our lives to benefit us. So what we find is this: God allows persecution and suffering for our benefit. L let me read what, what, what 1 Peter 5, verse 10 says. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ, he himself will restore you confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. God says, I am allowing suffering in your life because I'm going to restore you, I'm going to strengthen you, I'm going to establish you, I'm going to mature you. Now the enemy is just the opposite. The enemy allows suffering, brings suffering in our life because he wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy our testimony for God. He wants us to give up on God and quit on God. And that's what Paul is saying to these people. Don't you give up. Stand strong. Understand you need each other. We need to be one as a team, one mind and one spirit. I think there's also a promise that comes with suffering. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Part of the Beatitudes, verses 10 through 12. Matthew says this, or Jesus says this in Matthew. Blessed are those who persecute, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. Now get this, for your reward is in heaven. 
for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God says, I want you to understand that when you go through persecution, which persecution is going to happen if you determine that you're going to follow Christ and live for Christ, I want you to understand that there's a greater reward, that God is going to reward those who go through suffering and persecution in a way that honors him, that glorifies him, in a way that exalts him as being salt and light in the world. God is going to give us a reward for that. And so I says, I want you to suffer I want you to suffer graciously. I want you to live consistently as citizens. I want you to work collectively. I want you to, not only I want you to work collectively, but, but in that, I want you to contend courageously. And then I want you to suffer graciously. Look at verse 30. Engaging in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Understand the same things that are happening to me don't be surprised when they happen to you. You're engaged in the same type of conflict that you saw in me when I was there and now that you see in me as I'm in prison in Rome. We're engaged in the same kind. In other words, we're part of the same team that's going through the same thing. And sometimes what happens when we're going through suffering, we feel like we're the only people going through suffering, that we're the only ones hurting. And Paul wants you to, us to know that no, we're all guaranteed to go through suffering. And it's very interesting the word that he uses here Verse 30 says, engage in the same conflict. That, that word conflict is, is the word we get agony from. It means to, to go through something, to suffer to the point of agony where it hurts. I, I'm reminded in Luke chapter, chapter 22, verse 44, where it talks about Jesus. And it says there, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. The same word that's used. Being in agony, before going to the cross, it says that he was in agony facing the cross and facing the suffering he was going to go through. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That when Jesus dealt with conflict, when Jesus dealt with agony, he prayed. Church, I want us to understand something. As we deal with agony, as we deal with suffering, what God is calling his people to do is to be people of prayer, is to make sure we're getting a hold of the God of the universe and the God of heaven, and we're crying out for him. We're crying out for unity. We're crying out for peace. We're crying out for strength. We're crying out that he may be glorified. When we go through suffering, what we want to do is this. We understand that God brings suffering for our good, but he brings it also for his glory. And so we want him to be glorified and we're crying out for one another, not just myself, but we're praying for one another as we go through this. So we need to be people of prayer. Paul says, I want you to live worthy. I want you to live worthy of the gospel because it's the way we live that's going to have an impact in what we're going through. Let me just give you some things to talk about at home as you, as you, as you, as you deal with things at home. Two things, just real quick, two things. How are we as citizens of heaven to walk worthy before a society filled with so much division? How are we to walk worthy in a society filled with so much division and so much hurt? How are we to walk worthy? Talk about that at home. The second question I would say is this. For many believers, it comes as a surprise that, that Christ has called us not only to believe, but also to suffer. For his name. So how do we honor God in our suffering? How do we as a people honor God in our suffering? I hope you take time and, and look at those things. Listen, thank you for uh, joining us. I, I pray and thank you uh, for each one of you who are, who are visiting. And I want you to know that God loves you so much that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and he died for you and he wants to have a relationship with you if you would put your faith in Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand too, as we talk about all the things that are going on and all the changes that are needed and we need to pray for change and all these things, but the only thing that is really going to change people's heart is Jesus Christ. It has to be changed from the inside. Outside changes is not going to make, not going to make eternal differences. People have to come to know Jesus Christ. And so if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to encourage you. It will be the, one of the biggest things that you ever do is accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior by allowing him to come into your life, 
by asking him to forgive you of your sins, trusting that he died and rose again for your sins, that he paid the price for our sins, and accepting him into my heart and what he did for me as my Lord and Savior. If, you, if you've never done that, we want to encourage you to do that. There is a website and information that will come up on the screen. Please contact us. We'd love to show you how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We love you and we praise God for you. Father, now, thank you for your word. Bless, Lord God, your word in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, as we, as we celebrate our unity and we celebrate our oneness, we're going to take communion together because God has called us into the same body by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are one. And in taking communion, we're celebrating the oneness that's in the body of Christ and his love for us. God bless you. This is great that we're able to do communion virtually. And so I want to go to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 where Paul gives instructions on how to take communion. And he says there in 1 Corinthians, he says, I receive from the Lord that which I deliver to you. And the same night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And the same way he also took the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me and so we take communion to remember what Christ has done to remember his sacrifice to remember his giving his life for us but then he gives some other instructions he says for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you show forth you preach you proclaim the, the death of the Lord the Lord's death until he comes and so this is what we do because we believe that Christ is going to come back. But he says, whoever takes this bread or this cup in an unworthy manner is guilty concerning the body and the blood of Christ. He says, let each one examine himself and then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. If anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment to himself. And so Paul's warning is this, that when we take this bread, we're to really consider what it really means. And that if there's sin in our life, we need to deal with that sin in our life before we take this bread. And he says we're to examine ourselves, to take a moment and just examine ourselves, to get our hearts right before we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup. Father, I pray now as we uh, prepare to take your communion, I thank you that you have died for us. I thank you, Lord God, that even though we're not worthy in you, we become worthy. And I pray that you'd help us to examine our hearts to make sure, Lord God, that we deal with anything that's not pleasing to you. And we want to honor you and worship you and glorify you as we take of the communion. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul's comment there was he took the bread and he said, this bread is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We say this. This bread is the communion of the body of Christ. Would you repeat that with me? This bread is the communion of the body of Christ. Now I'm going to have Pastor Hunt come, and he's going to lead us in taking of the cup, which represents the blood of Christ. All right, as we continue... In our communion service, we're going to read again from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. It says, In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We're reminded that the cup that we take today is a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from our sins. Here we say, This cup is the communion of the blood of Christ. Please repeat that with me. This cup is the communion of the blood of Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to proclaim your death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you so much that you're coming again. And we thank you so much that you've died for our sins and redeemed us from our sins so that when you do come, we can go with you and spend eternity with you in heaven. Lord, we ask as we go through this week, 
You help us to faithfully proclaim this message to the world that needs to hear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Are one.